Hey guys, welcome to the studio where it is a balmy 66 degrees versus the negative 22 that it is outside. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the middle of the polar vortex snap of 2019, which means it's really freaking cold outside and a lot of local businesses, including mine, are actually closing down for employee safety. Yay! Let's get down to the real nitty gritty about this. Today we're celebrating our 300 subscribers! And I have only recorded this video over 13 times in order to figure out how I wanted to do it. And a polar vortex and being super cold brings up a really good idea for a really hot topic, and that is zoos. A lot of you viewers know that when we're talking about reference material, I don't download anything from the internet anymore. I mean, after about a year, I was like, I'm gonna go do my own. So I have a tendency of traveling to a lot of zoos and aquariums and wildlife parks and refuges in order to obtain enough reference material. Which brings up the hot topic of zoos, which seems to be a little bit of a hot button with some people because there are two arguments and two trains of thought on that. And one is that they're really super awful bad, oh my god, no zoo should ever exist ever in the history of ever stop. And the other one is, hey, you know what? Zoos promote conservation. They have reestablished previously extinct in the wild species such as the scimitar horned oryx. So zoos can't be all that bad. But there is no escaping the fact that zoos have a really, really sordid, bad history. Like, they weren't good at all. No. Okay. So, in celebration of us having 300 subscribers, thanks guys, uh, we are going to introduce um, this small little aspect that I'm going to every once in a while pop up, and it is kind of a HUD system that I have titled Galileo, and Galileo is going to be kind of here for kind of doing some running facts as we're going through tutorials and demonstrations, or just doing really boring narration and presenting facts. Um, so in this aspect, Galileo is going to be here to present some history of zoos, why they have such a bad reputation, and some of the history behind zoos, and then we're going to talk about things that I'm going to currently do to kind of do my own way of contributing to the better of the planet, the better of the world, and the educating of the public. Hello, I am Galileo. I am an ambassador class AI assistant. Until the early 19th century, the function of the zoo was often to symbolize royal power, like King Louis XIV's menagerie at Versailles. The modern zoo that emerged in the early 19th century at Halifax, London, Paris and Dublin, was focused on providing educational exhibits to the public for entertainment and inspiration. A growing fascination for natural history and zoology, coupled with the tremendous expansion in the urbanization of London, led to a heightened demand for a greater variety of public forms of entertainment to be made available. The need for public entertainment, as well as the requirements of scholarly research, came together in the founding of the first modern zoos. When ecology emerged as a matter of public interest in the 1970s, a few zoos began to consider making conservation their central role. From then on, zoo professionals became increasingly aware of the need to engage themselves in conservation programs, and the American Zoo Association soon said that conservation was its highest priority. Whipsnade Park in Bedfordshire, England, was opened in 1931 as the first safari park. It allowed visitors to drive through the enclosures and come into close proximity with the animals. Mass destruction of wildlife habitat has yet to cease all over the world and many species such as elephants, big cats, penguins, tropical birds, primates, rhinos, exotic reptiles, and many others are in danger of dying out. Many of today's zoos hope to stop or slow the decline of many endangered species and see their primary purpose as breeding endangered species in captivity and reintroducing them into the wild. 
modern zoos also aim to help teach visitors the importance of animal conservation, often through letting visitors witness the animals firsthand. Some critics and the majority of animal rights activists say that zoos, no matter what their intentions are, or how noble they are, are immoral and serve as nothing but to fulfill human leisure at the expense of the animals, which is an opinion that has spread over the years. Some zoos have walked through exhibits where visitors enter enclosures of non-aggressive species, such as lemurs, marmosets, birds, lizards, and turtles. Visitors are asked to keep to paths and avoid showing or eating foods that the animals might snatch. Some zoos keep animals in larger, outdoor enclosures, confining them with moats and fences, rather than in cages. Safari parks, also known as zoo parks and lion farms, allow visitors to drive through them and come in close proximity to the animals. Sometimes, visitors are able to feed animals through the car windows. The first public aquarium was opened at the London Zoo in 1853. An animal theme park is a combination of an amusement park and a zoo, mainly for entertaining and commercial purposes. Marine mammal parks such as SeaWorld and Marineland are more elaborate dolphinariums keeping whales and containing additional entertainment attractions. Another kind of animal theme park contains more entertainment and amusement elements than the classical zoo such as a stage shows, roller coasters, and mythical creatures. Some examples are Busch Gardens Tampa Bay in Tampa, Florida, Disney's Animal Kingdom and Gatorland in Orlando, Florida, Flamingo Land in North Yorkshire, England, and Six Flags Discovery Kingdom in Vallejo, California. By the year 2000 most animals being displayed in zoos were the offspring of other zoo animals. In the United States, any public animal exhibit must be licensed and inspected by the Department of Agriculture, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Depending on the animals they exhibit, the activities of zoos are regulated by laws including the Endangered Species Act, the Animal Welfare Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918 and others. Additionally, zoos in North America may choose to pursue accreditation by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, AZA. To achieve accreditation, a zoo must pass an application and inspection process and meet or exceed the AZA standards for animal health and welfare, fundraising, zoo staffing, and involvement in global conservation efforts. Inspection is performed by three experts typically one veterinarian, one expert in animal care, and one expert in zoo management and operations, and then reviewed by a panel of 12 experts before accreditation is awarded. This accreditation process is repeated once every five years. The AZA estimates that there are approximately 2,400 animal exhibits operating under USDA license as of February 2007. Fewer than 10% are accredited. In April 1999, the European Union introduced a directive to strengthen the conservation role of zoos, making it a statutory requirement that they participate in conservation and education, and requiring all member states to set up systems for their licensing and inspection. Zoos are regulated in the UK by the Zoo Licensing Act of 1981, which came into effect in 1984. A zoo is defined as any establishment where wild animals are kept for exhibition, to which members of the public have access, with or without charge for admission, seven or more days in any period of 12 consecutive months, excluding circuses and pet shops. The Act requires that all zoos be inspected and licensed, and that animals kept in enclosures are provided with a suitable environment in which they can express most normal behavior. Okay, so clearly zoos have a rather sordid history, and not all zoos are accredited. Currently, according to the AZA website, there are currently 233 accredited zoos and aquariums. Here's the surprising thing, is that most people who have had a huge problem in the past with SeaWorld, SeaWorld is considered an accredited zoo, while the Shedd Aquarium down in Chicago is not. I was actually kind of surprised about that because when you go through the shed they have a lot of information and a lot of stuff that I personally learned about different uh, kinds of fish and different kinds of 
aquatic environments and some conservation efforts they had done like down in the Amazon with the Amazon River and everything and the effect of dying off of the Great Barrier Reef that's recently happened. So I was really surprised to find out that places like the Shedd Aquarium are not accredited while SeaWorld, which has had such a huge fallout with their killer whale program, which they are no longer doing. They're no longer going to be showing their orcas or breeding orcas, but they will consent to continue to have their uh, conservation efforts. They are accredited and the Shedd is not. They have applied for accreditation, so um, that's something that I was rather surprised at. So one of the things that I'm going to decide uh, as of 2019, and it will be a pretty big one, and that is we are going to eliminate taking reference pictures at non-AZA accredited facilities. So that means that we are not going to be shooting anything else at Timbavadi. Timbavadi Zoo is, to say the least, a really popular attraction out in Wisconsin Dells. I have visited it a total of three times and we will be visiting it no more. Because the last time I went to it, I became profoundly aware of certain aspects of it that I was finding rather unsavory. And it wasn't like blatant animal abuse, dirty enclosures or anything like that. It was the fact that, like the tigers, I'm going to pop up an image here, the tigers and the lions are kept in rather barren enclosures. And the enclosures are very reminiscent of 19th century zoos where the cats aren't really given anything to really interact with, there's no climbing materials, there's nothing really to obfuscate the uh, viewer's eye, and honestly, there's an awful lot of cats for such little amount of space. So that was the first thing that was just like, you know what, I, I, I don't I don't think I like this place. The second is, is that they do do uh, pictures with baby animals and that is profoundly become a hot topic um, and Tim Vivati does do that. Uh, they have a regular breeding program with their tigers uh, that they do off of the Tempavati Park site and I've been told by some park employees that they have three locations in Wisconsin um, where they display their animals and that there's one central farm in Wisconsin where they do do breeding and that they will rotate their animals um, on and off exhibits and throughout the three properties they own that display them to the public. I think one of them is in Lake Geneva although I have not I have not figured out where that place is, and I'm probably not going to go there. Uh, there will not be any more going to Timbavati for me, because um, they really exploit their tiger breeding program just to get pictures with them. In addition to that, I will not be staying at the Kalahari out in the Wisconsin Dells until this practice is pretty much stopped, because again, when the baby cats are not on display, or being manipulated at Tim Avadi, they take the baby cats to the Kalahari on the weekends and they have guests be able to pay to get their picture taken with the baby tigers at the Kalahari. So I will personally be putting a ban for myself on staying at the Kalahari or associating with the Kalahari out in the Dells or going to Tim Vivati. Um Which is kind of a shame. Um, it's kind of a shame. I wish they were more geared for actually animal conservation and being more educating to the public and less of an attraction thing. The thing that really broke my back was not the cats, it was not the big cats, it was a few years ago when I went there for some reference pictures because they happened to have had a clouded leper on display and that's what got me asking questions. Uh, about what happens with the baby cats and the conditions that the uh, cats are, the big cats, the lions and the tigers, the adult ones, uh, are kept in and some of the other things that you take for granted when you go to an AZA accredited zoo. They had a two-toed sloth that was on display for one of their uh, wildlife shows, which they proudly display here. Okay, They had a two-toed sloth on display for a presentation and 
sloths and certain kind of exotic creatures uh, that are primarily wild creatures uh, in the recent years have become quite popular. I don't know why people think they're cute. I don't find sloths particularly cute, especially when you realize they basically move so slowly they have a whole ecosystem living in their fur. I kid you not, they actually don't advise you handle an actual wild sloth because you will probably get sick be coming in contact with some of the stuff that lives on their coats and the moss and lichen that live on a sloth. They move so slowly. In learning that, uh, I also learned that uh, you can kill a sloth by exhaustion if you have it move around too much. We're talking about an animal that literally only comes out of the treetops to defecate once a week. These animals don't move. There's a reason why sloth is one of the seven deadly sins. In 20 minutes, a 20 minute presentation I watched the sloth be handled a lot. They did bring out a tree for the sloth to hang on. However, the person doing the presentation wasn't content with the sloth just hanging from the tree and giving the public facts about the sloth. They actually felt the need to manipulate the sloth a lot, move the sloth around a lot, and then hang the sloth off of a guardrail where they did pig races. And the sloth, in the desperate attempt to be left alone, <clears throat> tried to effectively get away from the presentation and maybe go somewhere where it wasn't going to be disturbed so much. It didn't really work for the sloth. <clears throat> it didn't really work for the sloth and I had decided that this was pretty much going to be the end of me going up to Timbavati even if the reference pictures were going to be surreally hard for me to get a hold of. Um, it did not seem ethical in any way, shape, or form to exploit some of these animals just to get the reference pictures when seemingly I could get them from better, more ethical resources. Which gets back to the reasons why I am a big fan of doing my own photography do, rather than downloading it off the web. Um, that is a really big thing with me because not only as an artist can you learn more about the animals and their movements and the, the line of sights and the actions and the action lines that you can create within a piece. Doing your own photography and observing these animals in real life rather than just downloading pictures off the web. But then I know the ethics behind what is going on with that animal. I know that the animals are not exploited and being treated cruelly just for the sake of getting a reference shot. So <clears throat> there will be there was, there was never really going to be any downloading anything really off the web as far as doing reference material for my art. Even if they were royalty free pictures, which some artists do that and they have limited resources and I get that. Uh, I just ethically, I don't know that I could do that because I like to be able to actually see the habitats and observe the animals and get to know the animals. Uh, but I want to know that those animals are actually being taken care of in some kind of ethical way and that they're not being exploited. So, back to the zoo thing. So Timbavati is out. Um, zoos that are AZA accredited such as the Columbus Zoo, they're still on the plate though. I really enjoyed going to the Columbus Zoo, the Toledo Zoo, the National Zoo out in Washington DC. They were all really really rich in experiences. I got a lot of great pictures and a lot of great experiences. Last year, if you watched the 2018 recap, I got the opportunity to go out to Disney's Animal Kingdom, which I was surprised to find out was really, really heavy, heavy into animal conservation. When you go to the rest of the Disney parks, and one of the reasons I went to Orlando was to kind of be able to put everything in my life on hold and be so distracted I didn't have to deal with a lot of the responsibilities I do, including some of the stuff on this channel that kind of stresses me out. And I did the, the other three Disney parks before I had done uh, Animal Kingdom, I did Animal Kingdom last, and I was actually so touched by the vast differences between Magic Kingdom, Hollywood Studios, and Epcot to Animal Kingdom that I was like blown away. At some point when I was watching the Rivers of Light show, I was actually in tears because they were being so uh, self-conscious and conscientious of the fact that they have all these animals that they are in caretaking of 
and the conservation efforts and the fact that they try for self-sustainability and that if you take the uh, the Rafiki train back to their conservation station they do open uh, air kind of exams and uh, perform exams and some kind of medical procedures on their animals if you take the conservation train over to, to Rafiki's it's it's a thing I can't remember what it's called it's Okay. It's called Rafiki's Watch, that's what it's called. Um, but if you take the train back behind all the exhibits to Rafiki's Watch, which is a whole separate part of the park, uh, it's very, very much on the line of conservation and self-sustainability and uh, reintroducing uh, animals back into the wild. In fact, um, one of the things that actually turned me back on to going to a Disney park for uh, a vacation rather than you know, just going anywhere is as bad as it is, is that um, Tim Bavadi had a scimitar horn oryx that they had purchased from Disney World and that they had told me that Disney actually is actively supporting the return and the restoration of the scimitar horn oryx which is either it still is endangered in the wild or is still extinct in the wild and they're working on reintroducing it it's somewhere in that little limbo world right now, but that Disney is very, very heavily involved in restoring some of these very endangered animals and to go to Animal Kingdom and actually watch how uh, active Disney is being in the aspect of restoring some of these animals and the fact that way back when I was a kid, the Disney's Jungle Cruise was aspired to be what Animal Kingdom is today is like such a huge growth for a company as big as Disney that I was really really touched and I can't wait to go back I thought it was just great to watch that stuff go on so on the hot topic of are zoos necessary or are they bad it's a little bit of both much like going to a fast food restaurant and ordering something to eat it's all on moderation um, there are a lot of places overseas like in China and India that really really abuse the status of a zoo. Originally zoos were meant as kind of a status symbol and a lot of places still have zoo as just status symbols. They are not meant there to be educating or conservation or anything of the like. And I can honestly say that there's a few places around here that um, support that kind of roadside seediness and we're just not gonna go there anymore. We're not gonna support them by paying admission or uh, showing off their animals or really doing anything to kind of fuel the fires of backyard breeding with wild animals. Uh, I would rather support places that are AZA certified, that control their breeding program, and that are more ethical in the way that they run their businesses. All right, we're going to sign ourselves off from going to places like Timbavati Wildlife Park and limit ourselves down to AZA accredited places like the Columbus Zoo, the Milwaukee Zoo, Disney's Animal Kingdom, and I have yet to experience the San Diego Zoo and Safari Park. So if there's a place that you know that's an AZA accredited zoo or safari park that you think I should check out, I'd be welcome to do it. And that would be all for today, signing off from the studio. Have a great day.